All right, guys, very pleased to be joined now by John Scott, who is brought to you by our friends over at Greta, the home of our electric watch parties. Greta is Canucks Army's spot to catch the game throughout the season, playoffs, and also our place to chill in the offseason. Let's get to him now, former NHL All-Star John Scott, uh, the host of the Drop in the Gloves podcast, part of the Nation Network family of podcasts. John, thanks so much for taking the time today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so our listeners who have listened to our last episode know exactly why we had you on. And I gave you a little briefing as well that on our last episode, the topic of player safety in the NHL came up. And I just started basically parroting what you said uh, on one of your recent episodes of Dropping the Gloves because I found it so interesting. And then I said on air, we should just have John Scott on the show. And two days later, we have you on the show. So let's start there. We've seen stuff with Nick Cousins since that episode of Dropping the Gloves came out that I'm referring to, uh, but it was in the context of Dylan Larkin talking about how he doesn't feel safe and how he has talked to players around the league who feel the same way. Uh, your take on player safety right now in the NHL? Well, I, I think it's a moving target for a lot of players and there's no consistency and players don't know where the league stands, especially the player safety side, George Peros where on any given night you could have the same hit in three different games and they could get three different suspensions. It could be two minute penalties in one game. It could be five in a game in another game, and it could be just nothing in another game. So I think where players are coming from, they're just frustrated because there's no consistency to anything nowadays. A, a hit from behind could, like I said, be anything. And the players just want to know, okay, if I do this, I get this amount of games, I get this amount of penalties, and this is the this is the penalty for that action. And right now, like nobody knows. You could elbow a guy and get 10 games or get nothing. So I think the players are frustrated. And when that happens, you see the, the rats of the world, they take advantage of that because they know if they do something, well, maybe I might get one game, maybe I might get 10 games, maybe I might get jumped, and then they get a penalty. And then we, we get the advantage. So those guys are taking advantage of the situation of just the complete unknown that the NHL has kind of – facilitated by not not hammering people when they should so with the context of all that like how does the league address this because look I, I again like i said i listened to that episode of dropping the gloves and i found it really interesting when you brought up you know the clutching and grabbing rules and the hooking penalties and how the league kind of got that out of the game uh like what's your proposition there well, like I said, I, I was a part of the institution of all those rules, and I hated them at first because I, I just went to the penalty box all the time in the preseason because the refs just called it like crazy. You touch a guy, you're going in for two for hooking or slashing or interference or whatever it was. It took me a couple months to get used to the new rules, and then I, I knew how to play the game. Nowadays, I think the, the NHL should just come out and say, if you're, if you're really trying to get rid of these hits. So I think that's the first thing. If you really want to get rid of these dangerous plays, the hits to the head – the dangerous areas around the boards, two feet from the boards. You have to say, if you hit anybody on the numbers, regardless of how fast you're going, regardless if he's injured, you're getting a three game suspension, whatever the number is, but you're getting suspended. If you high stick someone in the, in the face, regardless of the situation, you're getting a game or you're getting a two minute penalty or you're getting fined. There has to be some set standard. And then you have to make sure the refs just do it across the board for the first year and say, we're just going to go all in, and we're giving everybody suspensions for this. So there has to be that kind of push for it, and there hasn't been. That's why the refs are just – every ref, ref has a different personality, but when you mentioned how they got rid of hooking and this and that, all the refs were mandated by Batman. He said, you're, mm. you're calling this, and you're calling it over the top, and, and we learn pretty quick because you don't want to penalize your team. So I think that's what it's going to take – to get rid of these hits. Cause right now you guys, it's just, I have no idea. You see a hit and you go, well, maybe it's two, maybe it's five, maybe it's, you know, five games. You, you just don't know on the night in night out basis. Over the weekend, Kevin BX on hockey night in Canada had a pretty epic rant on uh, Nick cousins and some of the uh, dangerous hits he's made that have um, sort of gone undetected as far as uh, the, the department of player safety. What were your thoughts on BX's take there? And is cousins the type of uh, player where that trend continues and the league has to make an example out of him? Well, I, I I'm buddies with Kevin. I thought, I thought he was spot on. I had the same reaction to cousins when he hit good Branson. That night, I think there was so many hits, like there was a Gabranson hit, there was another one some other way in the league where people were just hitting people from behind. So 
I thought it was fantastic. And players like Nick Cousins, who is a good hockey player, but he has that edge to his game. If he knows he's not going to be suspended or penalized, he's going to continue to do it. And it incentivizes his team like on the good Branson play. No penalty, even after review. He gets on a shift. Good Branson jumps him. Columbus gets the instigator. They score in the power play and win the game. So Florida wins that game because Good Branson or uh, Cousins hits Good Branson from behind. So if I'm Cousins, I'm going into the rest of the season going, I'm going to start burying guys from behind. Why wouldn't I? You know what I mean? And so that's what BX is talking about. These rats, quote unquote, they see this opportunity and they take advantage of it. Like, I, I get it. He's trying to stay in the league, trying to stay relevant. And why wouldn't Nick Cousins do that? It makes no sense for him not to. You go out, you play physical, you cross that line every once in a while and you don't get penalized. It's a win-win for him. And then you get jumped and you turtle and you get a power play out of it. That's great. That's fantastic. So there's, there's, they got rid of the instigator and the NHL's job was to police the players and to keep them protected. And that goes back to Dylan Larkin, why he doesn't feel safe out there because they're not doing their job. I find it so interesting, especially in the context of like, you know, being a former enforcer yourself, there's not many enforcers left in the game, but we saw, at least I think from what I remember, like we saw less of this, like enforcers were a deterrent, whether people like it or not. And I know maybe, maybe not so much anymore, but enforcers were a deterrent. Like when you were, when you were on teams like that, did you see these kind of hits? No. And there was the outlier every once in a while, because you can't like, there are some players who were just psycho, like um, Zach Ronaldo would run around like crazy. And so I would have to tell Zach, like, constantly, I-, I will I will kill you. Like, literally, I will break your face. And if that didn't work, I would say, I'll, I'll just jump one of your star players. Hence what I did in Toronto when I jumped Phil Kessel. So I told their tough guy, I said, if you want to fight, if you're going to mess around, you're not going to fight me. I'm, I'm going to go after one of your star guys. And, I, ha- you know, you, you have to do something to kind of dissuade that. But the, the toughness factor definitely plays a part in this. I, I played with star players, whether it's the Thomas Vanek's or the Gabrick's or the Taves or the Jumbo Thornton's. They tell me after the season, I loved playing with you because I had so much more free ice. I had so much more room out there. And I know it's effective. I know I didn't get many fights. It's because nobody wanted to fight me and nobody would hit. And I, I bring up Chris Neal sometimes because when we would play Ottawa, Neal would average like 10 hits a game throughout the season. And then we would play Ottawa and he would get maybe one. It's because he was scared. I was going to beat his doors off and he's a tough kid, mm. but there's the fear factor and it's real and everybody's human. And I would change my game. If I knew I was going into Edmonton and Steve McIntyre was there. I go, okay, maybe I don't finish that check. I don't want to fight Steve McIntyre. And I was six, six, eight, 270 pounds. So imagine if you're 200 pounds, six foot, and you have someone breathing down your neck who could literally end your career or if not season, you know what I mean? So yep. it, it does work you guys. And I know people, Oh, well, there'd still be people running around. Maybe not as much, not nearly as much. A uh, fighter of a smaller stature in Vancouver, who's obviously a legend in this town. Uh, what do you remember about Rick Rippin and his fighting style, uh, switching hands, his boxing style where, you know, he's he, like, there's that fight against Hal Gill. I'm sure you've seen it where he's switching mm-hmm. hands. He's blocking. Like, what do you remember about Rick Rippin? Played against Ripper many times. Just one of those guys who was a natural talent at fighting. I think he was a gold gloves boxer and had every gift for fighting on the ice, the, the mentality for it, the skills to do it. His only downside, if you can call it that, was his size. Like I, He was just too small to mess the big guys, but he was a killer, man. I, I remember playing him quite a bit when I was in Minnesota, and I was always nervous if he would ask me to fight. He never did because I weighed like 100 pounds more than he did, and rightfully so. I was way out of his weight class, but he was, he was one of those guys who if he caught you with one, you knew it was going to sting. But, yeah, he was, he was one of the – best he wasn't even a middleweight he was a lightweight he was always fighting up in his weight class and that guy could shock him man lefts and rights and he just had had a forever engine he would never stop shifting gears a little bit to the canucks they've had a wonderful season so far watching them what's the biggest surprise for you in terms of why they've perhaps been able to find so much success uh, there's a couple things. Obviously, Thatcher Demko finding his game. I think that's helped him out them out hugely. He was I don't know what happened to him last year. If he was injured or just not feeling it, he's a completely different goaltender this year to last. Um, Elias Pettersson, I, I hated him his first few years. I, mean, I know he was putting up points. I didn't think he had that leadership quality. 
I didn't really like how he went about his first contract situation. He's like, I'll wait and see. Maybe if we get some good players and I'll sign, that doesn't scream leadership to me. All of a sudden he he's completely changed my perspective on him. I think he's got everything and more. He he's the guy I wanted my team leading my team. I think he's, he's done well kind of galvanizing that group. And then Quinn Hughes, I think he's accepted the challenge of being a one, a defenseman and not just a one dimension offensive guy. And when your top three players do that and they have, or have it all outstanding years and, and taking criticism. And instead of just, you know, saying, no, 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 we're fine. We're fine. They accept it. And then they learn from it and then they get better. I like that. And then you add all these other pieces at JT Miller's Connor Garland's having a pretty good season. You have the Kuzmenko's and then your defense is vastly improved. Getting, getting rid of OEL helped. He was a liability back there and Mizey and bringing in, who was the trade you got from Detroit? Um, you got a Ronick. first rounder from him. He's been fantastic. Everybody yeah. thought that trade was crazy. First rounder for Ronick, like nuts. And he's been playing great. So everything's worked out great for the Canucks this year. What do you think their ceiling is? We've we've heard guys like Darren Drager call them a cup contender, and we you know we've kind of we've kind of come to the conclusion they're just below that, but maybe they're close. What's your perspective on this Canucks team ceiling? Uh, well, it's, again, it's still early. We're forty games in. The, the, the cup is their ceiling right now. Like they're right there. I think they're top five, six in the league. They're, they, I think they need to add another piece to be in the conversation with the Get Vegas Golden Knights in the West Conference, but. I firmly believe they'll be in the Western Conference Finals if, if the way this keeps going. Winnipeg will be there. Edmonton's getting better. But Vancouver, what what is not to like about this lineup? They have two solid first lines. Their defense is solid, and they have Patrick Demko. I think if they add another piece, I don't know how the depth is, maybe a penalty-killing guy who can go out there and win face-offs when you need him to. So they, it's it's it has to be the cup, right? Like, what else is it when you have that roster and you're spending this much money? It has to – it has to be a cup appearance. Yeah, that's got to be your goal. Absolutely. Uh, switching gears, speaking of cup contenders, those Toronto Maple Leafs uh, go out and sign William Nylander. Your thoughts on that deal that was just signed this morning? Well, we were joking before we came on. It's like I, I, when they signed the deal, I just was going through my head. Usually teams that do this, they're forced to do it because they have multiple Stanley Cups under their belts. So it's like <laughs> we got to keep the core together. We have to. These guys have been together for seven years and they have one round win. That's it. One. And they're re-upping these guys. And next year they have $52 million allotted to their forwards and they still have to sign like six guys. And then you have Morgan Riley on the back end and you still don't have a goaltender. I don't know. Like maybe this makes sense in two years when Johnny T leaves and you free up some of that money, but next year they're going to be, I don't know how you round out this roster next year. That's going to be the thing. You're going to lose a lot of players on this team. You're not bringing back Bertuzzi or Domi. There's no way you're bringing back Brody or any of those guys. So it's just, I get it. Willie's a great player. 11 and a half. It's a lot. That's a lot. Like he's top five in the league now. Like he's in the same conversation as McDavid and Posternock and those guys. Do you think he's that good? I don't. I think he's good. But I don't think he's that good, you guys. You know, uh, I, I want to ask you with the context of Elias Pettersson then. Like, Elias Patterson is kind of in that same conversation because we expect Elias Patterson is probably going to sign for around the same that William Nylander signed for. Like, where's he in that conversation? I think he goes for more than 11 and a half. When you, when you figure even just the recent history, Willie Nylander, his, his career high is 87. Patterson had 102 last year. This year he's going to get 100 again. So he's – you think he's signing for 11 and a half, you guys. You're, you're dreaming. He's getting 12 and a half, I think. So – yeah. He's, he's a young kid. He was a high draft pick by the Canucks, and he's a big dude. I think his number is 12, if not higher, for eight years. Yep. And do the Canucks pay that? They have to. So I, I think he's a proven stud, and you have to keep this guy. So wouldn't surprise me if he gets 12 and a half. Recently, the first picks for the NHL All-Star game were announced, uh, and I thought it was interesting. Uh, Seattle posted a, a video. <laughs> I don't know if you saw um, Dave Haxtell was um, giving Oliver Bjorkstra the news that he – he'd be Seattle's representative and that he'd have to cancel oh, yeah. his family plans. And <laughs> it's pretty interesting because uh, Bjork show was just like, Oh, okay. didn't seem thrilled about uh, going to Toronto. Uh, how do you think most players feel about going to the all-star game? Is it a bit of a drag in that you miss out on a vacation? Do players because you're all together sort of make the most out of that weekend? Um, uh, how do you think star players feel about all- all-star weekend? Well, to- I would figure you'd be excited if it's your first or second or third times. Like Ovi has just declined. Like he just said, I'm not going, I don't care how many votes I get, but 
it, it becomes old after a while for these star guys. I was around a few who just didn't want to go, but it's, listen, I, I don't know if you guys know, I was an all-star for one year. <laughs> I, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And it is an honor, like not a lot, a lot of guys to go. And I, I, I work for the Hawks now a little bit. I know Connor Bedard was crazy, you know, surprised and happy that he got voted in or elected and not even voted. So it's an honor. Players like it. I, I just think the guys who have gone 10 times just been there, done that, and they want to go spend some time with their family because the season is a grind. You don't get many breaks. And to have three, especially now, it's four days. So you have a long break with your family. You can go and relax. I think they'd rather do that than go do all the cameras and all the media stuff at the All-Star game. Fair enough. Fair enough. John, thanks so much for doing this. We really appreciate your time today. And uh, yeah, pe- plug anything you want. People got to go check out, obviously, dropping the gloves. But anything else you're working on that you want the people to check out? Nope. Nothing. <laughs> right on. I'm so right I don't like plugging myself, you guys. Just you're doing a great job. Keep watching Canucks conversation. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. All right, fellas. We'll see ya. Canucks conversation with Harmon and Quads every weekday at 2 p.m. Be sure to check it out on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. And if you missed it, go check it out on your favorite podcast catcher app.